Hi, and welcome to this ninth episode of the Raven Cast. This uh, is a particularly important episode for me because we are going to be talking about the life of Rene Girard with three people who knew him well, three of his very first students, Eric Gans, Sandor Goodhart, and Andrew McKenna. They're going to be talking about their relationship with Rene and about Rene's legacy going forward. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a warning here in the beginning. Uh, we had some technical difficulties, especially with the audio, but I've edited it and um, made it much better. Uh, near the end, when Andrew talks about Renee's legacy, especially for the biblical studies, we had some very difficult audio problems. So I cut that short and uh, redid the conversation with Andrew at a later time and cut that in. Um, so there'll be a little bit of uh, awkward cuts here and there, but um, I really enjoyed this conversation and I hope you will too. Hi everyone and welcome to this special edition of the Ravencast. My name is Adam Erickson and here at the Ravencast we are guided by Rene Girard's mimetic theory. And those of us who are involved in the mimetic theory community uh, know that um, we've suffered a great loss uh, last month. On November 4th, 2015, Rene Girard, our teacher, mentor, and friend uh, passed away at age 91. Uh, as we continue to be grateful for his amazing life, we also continue to mourn his loss. And one of the ways that I feel helpful in the mourning process is to listen to the stories of those who knew Rene well. And so I have invited three of his uh, first students to come on the Ravencast today and talk about uh, Rene's. Uh, life and their relationship with Rene, because one of the many things that Rene taught us is that we are our relationships. And so this conversation, I think, is uh, very important for all of us in the memetic theory community, um, especially since uh, this week is uh, the week of Christmas, and Rene would have been 92 years old on Christmas Day. And so uh, Eric Gans, and Andrew McKenna and Sandor Goodhart, thank you so much for being with us today to talk about the life of Rene Girard. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I will introduce each of you and then um, ask you some questions. And um, if you can, if you have any stories uh, that you would like to tell about your relationship with Rene, uh, feel free to feel free to talk about that. Um, Eric Gans uh, was Rene's very first uh, student. He is Distinguished Professor of French at UCLA. Eric teaches literature, critical theory, film, and he is the founder of Generative Anthropology. He is the editor of Anthropoetics, uh, the Journal of Generative Anthropology, which you can find online at anthropoetics.ucla.edu. Eric is the author or co-author of many books, including Science and Faith, The Anthropology of Revelation, A New Way of Thinking, Generative Anthropology in Religion, Philosophy, and Art, and The Girardian Origins of Generative Anthropology. Sandor Goodhart is Professor of English and Jewish Studies at Purdue University. He is the former president of the Colloquium on Violence and Religion, a conference dedicated to exploring mimetic theory. Sandy has written and co-authored many books on mimetic theory, including The Prophetic Law, Essays in Judaism, Girardianism, and Literary Studies and Sacrifice, Scripture and Substitution, Readings in Ancient Judaism and Christianity. Andrew McKenna is professor of French literature, culture, and Civilization at Loyola University. He is the former editor-in-chief of Contagion, Journal of Violence, Mimesis, and Culture. He has written the book Violence and Difference, Gerard, Derrida, and Deconstruction. 
Andrew has written many articles on mimetic theory and generative anthropology in academic journals, which you can find on his faculty page and at Loyola's website. I will link to um, all of those websites and those books in the show notes, which you can find at the Raven Foundation website. Um, so once again, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to see you and um, to talk about the life of Rene Girard. Um, the first question that I want to ask, and maybe if you can each uh, take this first question individually. Eric, we'll start with you and then go to Andrew and then Sandy. Um, if you could tell me uh, where you met Rene and how old were you when you first met him? I met Rene um, when I came to Johns Hopkins in 1960. I had graduated from Columbia and the people at Columbia told me I should go to Hopkins rather than Yale because they thought my personality wouldn't fit in at Yale, which was probably mm. true. <laughs> so when I came to Hopkins, uh, the uh, great man there was uh, Leo Spitzum, but unfortunately he died in the summer before I got there. So when I arrived, he wasn't there. And I was supposed to work with another professor that had been at Columbia before, whose name I won't bother to mention. So Giron, in other words, was not a main figure at Hopkins. He was an associate professor. But, you know, as soon as I took a couple of uh, his of courses with him, uh, I realized that he was uh, by far the most interesting person in the department. Uh, he taught modern literature. I remember a course on existentialism where he was discussing Sartre. In those days, it was a lot closer to Sartre. 1960, Sartre was still a very important figure. And um, so uh, he was an exciting teacher, uh, stimulating and very uh, charming, as we all know. And it was obvious that I wanted to work with him, although the people at Hopkins expected me to work with someone else. But uh, that wasn't really important. In any case, I was, uh, uh, he was the, the person that I uh, enjoyed being with and I always felt a sense of affinity. So uh, there was really no question. And when I started working on the dissertation that he was the person I chose as my advisor, I wrote about uh, Gustave Flaubert. And in those days, you know, you didn't, provide a prospectus and sort of write your dissertation before you wrote it, you just showed up and said, I think I'll write about Flaubert and uh, I guess I'll start from the beginning. And when I started from the beginning, I realized that that was enough. I uh, eventually wrote my dissertation on Flaubert's early works, which were the first the things he wrote when he was 15, but you know, that was enough for a dissertation. But I have to say also that Rene was this was when he was publishing Mensonge Romantique, which would make his reputation and make him famous. And uh, he gave a number of little talks about it in the department, especially on uh, Don Quixote. But he never insisted that I follow his uh, method, if you like, in writing my dissertation. He only insisted that I write clearly and that I avoided what he called uh, my dandyism which is sort of implying uh, that uh, you know something, but you're not really telling the reader. So he was a very conscientious director, very, uh, very serious and committed, and uh, not at all, uh, he made no attempt to kind of dominate or to show me that he had the right approach to things. Uh, but he did tell me afterward that he thought that uh, he had, uh, had it had a subterranean influence on my work. But just to finish up on this line, and this is something I developed in the book that you mentioned, which is called The Girardian Origins of uh, Generative Anthropology. It was really when I read La Violence et le Sacré, which came out in 72, that is uh, six years after I finished my dissertation. And that was really the book that made me if you like a Girardian, although I never cared for the term mimetic theory, I'd be happy to discuss that later. So I wasn't really, when I wrote my dissertation, I was using a method that was essentially Freudian or post-Freudian, uh, looking at the family relationships in these stories, which were always fairly uh, consistent. 
essentially using the method of Charles Moron, if anyone remembers him. But, uh, you know, but Giraud, uh, as I say, had a light touch. I really appreciated the way he directed the dissertation. So uh, that's my, you know, I have a few stories to tell, but I'll let the other guys tell theirs first. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. Um, Andrew, what about you? What, tell me about um, where you met Rene and how old you were. Uh, I met him uh, right out of college into graduate school. So I guess I was 21. It was 1964. I received a fellowship uh, to uh, study French at Johns Hopkins, which I accepted because I didn't have a better offer. I really wanted to do comparative literature. So uh, I thought Hopkins had a department, but they didn't. It was fine with me because um, once I had Rene as a teacher, uh, uh, it was over for me. Uh, I'm, I'm a literature lover. I was raised on, let's say, um, European fiction. Let's say the Victorian novel, and what comes after that is Dostoevsky. What comes that is well, any novel you can find. It could be Henry Fielding or Jean-Paul Sartre. But that uh, taking his courses, I realized that well, goodness, this is why I love literature. There's something here. I went to a Jesuit. Where uh, you took philosophy and theology, and of course I took a lot of, of literature courses, especially when I studied for a year in France. Um, and I knew that philosophy and theology didn't get it. You know, I realized well, this, there's no future with this, not for me anyway. I knew that literature was the hook, uh, that it was um, offering uh, something really important that the, the, the academic discipline. Um, couldn't grasp, and you see that's the difference with literature. We study literature; it's an academic discipline. But of course, uh, the the uh, but writers keep writing. You see what I mean? Literature is not uh, like philosophy in that regard. So anyway, I was simply taken with him and took all the courses with him that I could take. And the funny thing about that, regarding Eric's remarks, I was going to write on Flaubert. Um, and I could see the Girardian say, you know, direction of that. And he said, don't do it, because if Sartre's book comes out on Flaubert while you're writing it, you'll have to rewrite the whole thing. So I chose Baudelaire, Baudelaire and Sartre, and that kept me in both centuries, you see. And so it widened my sphere of activity. Uh, and frankly, it was very remote operation with Rene because I was always half a country or, or, or an ocean away from him while I was writing it during my first first jobs. Uh, but the fact is, uh, I I didn't see myself writing uh, a Girardian uh, dissertation. That wasn't in the air, if you will. I had the courage to reread it about a year ago, and I realized, yes, the only thing missing in this thing is Rene's name. Frankly, I was too awed by him, you know, to pull him into this, you know, conversation that I had run up between Sartre and Baudelaire to see that what it is that uh, attracted me about that conversation was just um, what you said. I Reality is relational. The thing there... Uh, it was not talking about mimetic theory. That word wasn't available. The word around um, then was dialectical. And it simply meant that the idea, you were talking across, uh, you didn't wrap your mind around concepts or, or around institutions. And the, uh, and I still remember those conversations. Well, the Tocqueville is a dialectical thinker and, and so was Stendhal and so was Balzac and not so much Mallarmé, perhaps that will offend Eric, but the uh, romantics were not dialectical. They were very subjectivistic and, and, the, and they, were, they were that dualism. And his thinking simply blew the doors off all kinds of dualisms. Uh, and you began to think you know, relationally about everything. Uh, and that hasn't stopped. I mean, I'm always finding more and more things to uh, investigate or interrogate or research on uh, with that uh, with that relational point of view. And of course, I have a tremendous debt to Eric's work, precisely because he takes uh, that question of relations down to another level, the linguistic level, that uh, Rene would throw words out here. We all had to be studying, you know, linguistics and structuralism and social and all that, uh, but that that. That, that wasn't going anywhere, you see, because uh, it was really very formalistic. In any case, I think I've answered your question. You want to move on to Sandy. 
<laughs> yes, thank you, Andrew. Sandy, what about you? Well, <clears throat> I met uh, Renee in 1969. Uh, I guess I was born in 46, so it would make me, what, 23 years old. And I just calculated that I knew him for 46 years, which is just exactly twice as long as I had been alive when I first met him. I don't know what significance that has. Uh, but uh, I met him in the second semester of the first year I was in graduate school. So 19, I, I went to SUNY Buffalo in 1968, and someone said, you got to get this professor, hear this professor from Hopkins who has come up and brought a whole bunch of people. Uh, I guess Joe Riddle talked about it, and uh, um, you know, Joe Harari was a graduate student at that point, and, and, and Eugenio Donato was talking about him, you know, and he was like the head of this whole group of people who had just come from Hopkins. And I guess that they were still riding on the crest of the 1966 Hopkins uh, uh, symposium that Dick Maxey and Eugenio Donato had put together. And I remember, I always, and I've said this many places, I always remember the first words that I heard Renee say, which were, Human beings fight not because they're different, but because they're the same. And because in, in their uh, attempt to become, uh, the first words I heard, I always hear, I always hear the first words in my mind that I, when I met Rene Girard, I walked into his class and it was called Literature, Myth, and Prophecy. And I figured, okay, any class with a title like that's going to be interesting. And first words are human beings fight not because they're different, but because they're the same, because they've made themselves into enemy twins uh, in, in reciprocal violence. And that just idea just blew me away because, you know, I, I'm product of the uh, baby boomer generation in which uh, people fight because they're, they're different. And, and he's saying exactly the opposite, not because they're different, because they're the same. And I, and I suddenly thought this is going to cause havoc in everything that I've you know, romantically and egoistically understood in my life. And I remember calling uh, my then wife uh, and saying, this guy is, is changing everything that I'm thinking. I either called that night or the next day. or uh, And obviously, the, you know, there were things going on already that were changing for me, and this provided a uh, trigger. In any case, uh, I, I listened to his lectures. Uh, I very shortly after that realized that I needed to know everything uh, in the, about the context that he was coming from. Uh, he had written this book on the book, but uh, he told me he was working on Greek tragedy and he'd been reading Oedipus, so I obviously had to, had to work on that. Uh, and I started intensifying my, the, the college French that I, I knew. I signed up for a course with Eugenio Donato. And in short order, either uh, that semester or the next semester, I asked him if he would be available to direct my dissertation. And he said, well, probably. I, I was the first one at at Buffalo to ask him, and he probably could do that. Um, and then I, you know, but I had no idea what I was going to work on. I, I just knew that, that this this man was the most fascinating, interesting man I had ever encountered uh, in my academic life. So I, I, uh, I guess I'm skipping now to the, uh, the dissertation. Uh, I realized that he would have these frameworks and would articulate these frameworks. But would and would pick out certain moments, Theresius and Oedipus arguing with each other, respectful one moment, at each other's throats the next moment, and showing how this, this, this position of difference suddenly turned into a position of violence with no, you know, seamlessly, with no, with no break. And so it always occurred to me that violence was difference gone wrong, and, and, that, and that in some sense difference was violent separation that was working uh, respectfully and, and uh, in an exalt you know, exalting manner. So uh, it occurs to me that it occurred to me that that I could read the play and do what I did best, which was close reading. I had been trained uh, in Philadelphia at Temple University as a kind of close reader, and that always uh, had fascinated me. The idea of close reading. I read Dylan Thomas, and I read uh, Wordsworth, and Keats, and, and Dunn, and Shakespeare, and all the English writers that one reads when in, in the late fifties when one was learning close reading. You know, Lanth Brooks was the god of close reading at, at that moment in English literature. And I thought, I can do close reading, even though it's in Greek and 
And, uh, you know, René Girard comes from a French context. Here I am in English. I could do some close reading of Oedipus. And I started gathering all these languages together. And I realized that there was something there that, that fully sustained what it is that he did, which was the, uh, the fact that Oedipus appropriates his position rather than discovers it empirically. And thought, my God, you know, René hadn't actually said that, but he, what, he, what he was talking about was an appropriative desire. And there it is in the play. Um, I can put these two things together and, and it's a perfect mesh. And it would, it would occasion a whole new understanding of, of Oedipus tyrannous. Uh, and I raised, you know, raised the idea with him and he thought it was a good idea, that this was a good idea. I guess there's, I'm, I'm leaving out one step and I'll, then I'll stop. And, and, uh, but I'm leaving out one step. There, at, at one point, uh, I had been, you know, I had been, been trained in Shakespeare and I had been reading Shakespeare and in fact, Renee, when Renee gave a course, he asked if any of us wanted to give presentations, and I volunteered to give a presentation on Othello. And so at some point, I did think that I would do my dissertation on Shakespeare's Othello. Um, and I, there, was a, a, there was a funny anecdote that I'll, that I'll tell you later on about, about the performance of Othello that took place during the time that I was giving the presentation. But uh, at some point, the, I realized the dissertation on Othello was not going very well, and I had started to work on Oedipus, and that's when I realized that the Oedipus was actually stronger. Number one, the play was shorter. I could do something more approximately cl closer to a, uh, a close reading uh, with, with, the, with the Oedipus, even though it wasn't in English. I could, you know, I have, if I have enough different translations of the Greek, and I started taking Greek with Gordon Kirkwood, I could kind of figure out uh, since I'm not, I wasn't, I wasn't really doing a sensitivity to the words. What I was trying to be sensitive to was, did you know, did was, was there any report about what happened to uh, Oedipus at, 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 the, at the, the land that was called Focus and so forth? I, I the way the level on which I was working would would lend itself to the kind of of, uh, of, transla of translations that I was working with. So I, I I asked him, I called him, I said, can I work on the Oedipus instead of the Othello? And he said, sure, fantastic. And, and so that's how I got to, to do that. And uh, I, uh, I think I'll stop now and, and uh, I'll, I'll let, turn the floor back over to you, Adam. <laughs> Thank you for that, Sandy. You have each talked about how fascinating Rene was, like almost at the very beginning of your relationship with him. What, what was it about Rene the man, Eric, that was so fascinating? Uh, he was a very charismatic lecturer. I always remember one thing about uh, when he would talk about a writer, he would read a passage and then he would say, you know, something like that. And uh, I'm sure you guys remember that. So, I mean, in other words, he, uh, he always dramatized the reality of uh, the specific point that he was making into something general. I think this was the drive that essentially is what made him uh, a fascinating figure and a major figure because he dared to do this. He dared to generalize on the basis of his intuitions to broad conclusions about uh, a, a given writer, but also uh, broad conclusions about humanity in general. And that's why when uh, he uh, wrote uh, Violence et le Sacré, I first understood that he had taken the triangle which was a relation between three individuals, essentially, and broadened it by putting the object in the center and then all the people around the, the periphery of the center were all mediating each other. And he made that into the model of humanity as such. That's why I was always frustrated that he didn't see that this was essentially creating a sign as opposed to simply scapegoating and so on. But that's unimportant. But the point is that he thought of that and this was very different from Freud's original idea in Totem and Taboo about killing the father, where everything is already established to start with. This was a creation of signification. So, uh, you know, to generalize from his behavior, I think that it's that kind of faith in your intuition, which is what distinguishes great thinkers from uh, timid ones. He was able to do that in class, and so he was a very effective teacher, but he did it also in his writing. And there's some brilliant things in some of his books that, uh, you know, I always remember just one more little thing. 
if you remember in Mansons Romantique, uh, he has this great line about, you know, you're going into, uh, essentially people in the world of desire are always looking to be uh, for obstacles. And so uh, you go into a field and you lift up rocks to see what the treasure is, uh, where the treasure is to find it underneath. But then, but what you really do is you get to the point where there's a rock you can't lift up and then you say, ah, the treasure must be under there. I thought that he says it very nicely, of course, in the book. I thought that was one of these brilliant kind of images that uh, Rene was capable of uh, generating. But, Thank you. Uh, but I mean, his, that book is the best of his best book in the sense of best written. But I think that he elaborates the intuitions in that in most in of uh, Yorosei de Sacre and then later in the uh, Shuls Kashi into a whole system. When that's when I realized the power of the system, not in reading Monsons Romantique. In yeah. other words, I think Monsons Romantique is in many ways his most complete book. I think people tend to misread it because they just look at the triangle of desire and then they worry about whether it's, uh, you know, uh, you know Jean-Pierre Dupuis with this thing about uh, whether it's really jealousy as opposed to desire. That's not really the point. The book is, it's a history of the novel and it's about how the novel displays to the modern world the problems of desire, which are fundamental to modern society. But the main word in that book is conversion. In other words, it's really a Christian book. He doesn't emphasize Christianity as a kind of a methodology, but it's really based on the idea that conversion is really the point. In other words, the point is getting beyond mimetic desire to understand the real world. It's not the sort of negativity that you see throughout the book in analyzing the mimetic desires of the characters who are, uh, whose desires are considered false. It's getting to the truth that's the essential thing. And the truth is the conversion of the novelist into someone who can write the novel and thereby who can understand the world mediated through, by Christ and not mediated by some uh, friend of his. I think that's really the point. And uh, that's why he ends on Ayosha after all. If you remember the end of the book, he doesn't end with uh, uh, with Shalus being whipped in the brothel. He ends with, uh, which after all, chronologically would have been the way to end it, right? He ends on Ayosha and on the sense of uh, the hope that faith generates in, in all of us. Thank you for that, Eric. Thank you. Andrew, what about you? What, what was so fascinating about Rene for you? Well very many of the things that Eric has just uh, said, I mean, uh, his, we call it charisma. Um, he, I was awestruck. In fact, I was, I mean, I'm so awed. Where does he get these toys? That, that I was very you know, shy about, you know, sort of talking with him and things like that. But the, that's what it is now. He uh, typically would assign a paper. He would want a research paper. Uh, on Stendhal or someone else, um, because of just what Eric's described. His classes typically, he'd have the text he's teaching, Stendhal, Proust, Camus, um, and he would just choose one paragraph and open it up. You know, the French have a word for this. It's called explication of the text. It's quite classical. Um, but he could, he, could just, he could just wrap the rest of the, the rest of the novel around this one paragraph of Proust or Camus, Condal, Flaubert, and yeah, tout Balzac, and and one of the one of the when he assigned a paper, this is what he wanted: get into the text and stay with the text. The text is more revealing than anything said about it. And at that time, Eric and I were in this environment of, of sort of. Uh, of, of, of humanism, it was belletrisme, you know, you, uh, that is to say the works are beautiful and so um, they're important, but they couldn't say why. And uh, Rene always made it very clear why uh, you, you prefer one text, you know, to another. And that I, well, to give a quote would match as uh, uh, Eric's about Balzac, when he assigned a paper, he says, that's what I want you to do. Find some place in the text that, and then just open it up and unpack it, DPA. And as far as, you know, doing this other kind of uh, criticism, he said, Sainte Beuve est toujours là. Now, Sainte Beuve was the, the literary historian of, of all of France, etc. And this was biographical criticism. 
Uh, and this was positivistic, and it, it certainly was, was important to know. And the other thing really dazzling about him was that he knew, uh, he knew the literary uh, critical and the humanistic tradition you know, very well. Uh, and, but he came to it from the outside. Remember, he got his degree in history from the University of Indiana. So he wasn't sucked into this kind of uh, humanistic impressionism that really dominated him. And the whole field, it wasn't just, I'd say he knew more. It was the quality of knowing by another order of magnitude for clarity, you know, for clarity and coherence than anything I had, you know, I had studied anywhere. Nice. Thank you. Um, Sandy, what, what about you? Do you have stories about what fascinated you about Rene? I think uh, the uh, conference when Rene was asked to joined with C.L. Barber in a presentation at, at SUNY Buffalo. And since Rene was known for talking about Proust, uh, uh, they, they said have, having C.L. Barber talk about Proust and have Rene talk about uh, uh, Shakespeare, which he hadn't really talked about. And he had only been hearing from conversations with me and, and my dissertation at that point. Um, so, he gives this presentation on Midsummer Night's Dream, and apparently he told me afterwards, he said, Martha had invited these people over and he wasn't very interested in the conversation. And so he went into the bedroom and he turned on the television and there was a, a production of Midsummer Night's Dream. And he, he says, Mickey Rooney was playing Puck as he remembers it. And he said, you know, he said, suddenly the whole thing came to him that all of Shakespeare was about mimetic desire. Um, and he gives, he gives this presentation, you know, the next day in uh, the conference and, and basically says the whole thing is about the desire and, and makes references to uh, the, the, the four lovers and the doubles and so forth. And C.L. Barber, who had written this book on uh, Shakespeare's festive comedy, was kind of the grand old man of ritual in Shakespeare studies, stands up and was sitting in the, fir- in the front row. And this was, you know, Renee's turn to talk about Shakespeare, which had, was not his topic. And uh, Barbara had been giving lectures on Proust. Uh, uh, he stands up and he says, "He says, I've, Renee, I've been teaching this play for 50 years, and you've just explained it to me." So it was. It was my sense that, that this man uh, was not afraid of big ideas. Rene Girard was not afraid of big ideas. He could ask questions about sacrifice, about desire, about violence, about religion. You know, when I, when I was uh, being trained. In, uh, in college, in, in uh, junior and senior, we were told that, you know, you really can't ask the big questions until you're in your 60s, which, you know, now I'm in my 60s, I've been asking them ever since then. But I, I was told I couldn't really ask them until I knew, you know, all that I could accumulate uh, until my 60s. But until then, I really you could only ask, well, you know, what, what is going on in this language, in this line, in this particular poem? Whereas here is this guy who is providing a framework for raising these serious questions about sacrifice, about desire, about scapegoats, about lynching, the possibility that the origin of culture is not some, some, some um, agreement that we made, but a murder, a killing, you know, a lynching. That just, you know, lynching would seem to me the most horrible thing one could imagine in American culture somehow could be the origin of all cultures. It just seems such a, a fascinating idea. But I want to come back to uh, that, that little conference because at one particular moment, uh, Rene, who was the acknowledged uh, authority at, at, at SUNY, Bu- SUNY Buffalo on Proust, was called upon to make a response to something that Al Cook had said. Now, Al Cook was the man responsible for bringing Rene Girard. Uh, uh, I think Leslie Fiedler had been come from Al Cook. Uh, uh, Joe Riddle, uh, Angus Fletcher. Ang- Al Cook was responsible for, for making Buffalo the Berkeley of the East. That was the talk of the time. The Berkeley of the East was 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 Buffalo, and 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 uh, either Rene gave a talk or or, uh, or Seal Barber gave a talk on on Proust. But in any case, one of them gave a talk on Proust, and Al Cook was making a response to Proust, and he and he has this long discussion, and Al Cook would begin, well, A, there's A, and then and then sub A, a sub one, and sub two, and under two, there's there's sub A, and so, you know, and Al, Al would have this. Uh, taxonomic way of talking, and and uh, he would stand up, and, and Rene had made some kind of statement in, in, in a, either a response or a lecture, and Al Cook, you know, went into A, B, 
Sabbe, Sabbe. And finally, he says, Renee says, please, Al, I know when Proust is lying. <laughs> I know when Proust is lying. <laughs> How do you respond to something like that? I mean, you have, you have to love the man in some sense who understands so much about Proust that he knows when he's lying. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. That, that seems to be an example of, of why and, and how this man was so charismatic for, for us. Uh, and one, why we wanted to work with him. We just basically soak up everything we could uh, mm -hmm. about what he was saying and, and what he was thinking. Uh, I don't know if that responds to your question. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great story, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> That's great, Sandy. And um, I, I, we're about ready to wrap it up. Um, but I guess the last question that I would um, ask you is, and we'll start with you, Sandy. What do you think Renee's legacy will be? Well, I mean, you know, I was just actually writing an obituary for Renee today for a magazine. And thinking about this, I think that the question in all the news, in all our reports is, is victimage and violence. And it seems to me that, that Renee, Renee's thinking is the poster child for the analysis of victimage and violence, and that uh, he offers us a way of thinking about the, the most pressing and contemporary, and at the same time, the most ancient problems of our time and our culture. I mean, nothing has changed in some ways in the last 2,000 years, maybe the last 2,500 years, regarding issues of, of sacrifice and violence and victimage. And he gives us, offers us a vocabulary. Maybe, you know, there'll be a different vocabulary someday or, or someone will have a slightly different theory. But he offers us what seems to me, for the first time, a framing of uh, a, a perspective that can get at all of the questions that are important to us questions concerning desire, questions concerning appropriation, questions concerning psychology, uh, political relationships, even things like ecology or, or, or medical research, or, uh, you know, we, we, we're looking for these unifying theories. And it seems to me that what Rene offers uh, us in a slightly different mode than the ways in which people like Stephen Hawking and others to, uh, ask for unifying theories is, is a unifying theory. He has a unifying theory uh, of culture. And it seems to me that uh, it's a theory, if you like, of difference itself, of the possibility of boundary making, the possibility of separation. I don't know of anyone else who has a theory of difference. I mean, there are thinkers in what's called continental theory who say, you know, everything is different. So if someone, a thinker like Gilles Beleuze, for example, will say everything is different, uh, and and uh, and Derrida will will have you know everything is a relationship between difference and aporia. But I mean they they in a, in a certain way, and this is going to sound kind of strange. They're somewhat limited. They're limited because they're not looking at the larger context that Rene would adopt, which is the context of the religious and the context of the deepest impulses that we have in our culture that allow us to think about things like violence and breakdown and crisis. Other thinkers, and maybe this will be the final point that I would make, other thinkers have theories of difference of one kind or another. Rene has not only a theory of difference, but a theory of the breakdown of difference, uh, a theory of crisis. He's one of the only thinkers that I know about who talks about how difference works and how difference does not work. Uh, and and uh, I. I think I should stop there. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Um, Eric, do you have thoughts on uh, what Renee's legacy will be? Well, I see, um, you know, since I created this thing called Generative Anthropology, I see Renee as essentially the founder of that. In other words, I feel that I've tried to, uh, in a way, uh, perfect his original intuition and in another sense go beyond it. But, But I think that basically, he has the basis, he created the basis for a real modern anthropology, an anthropology that isn't just the empirical study of different customs, but a, a very notion of what the human is. 
And what the human is, is precisely defined by the fact that I think, and here I don't see any reason to disagree with his basic intuition, which is that human beings, because they're more intelligent than other creatures, because in other words, they're more mimetic in the sense that the smarter you are, the more you can learn from others, the more you can understand from within their gestures and actions and then imitate them, that the human being reaches the point where he requires something that we can call culture. And I think that what, you know, the one thing that I've always, I never could get across to Rene is that culture involves language and you can't really talk about the human without talking about language. And here's a point that I think Andrew uh, also recognized in writing his book about uh, Derrida and Rene that you need the notion of deferral. In other words, the human being is not defined just by all jumping on and lynching somebody. It's defined by the gesture of hesitation, by designating, by using language to designate the sacred. But I think, I mean, I can say I sort of uh, discovered that, but I think that you have to give Rene credit for the basic intuition that we can understand the human on the basis of what you could call the scenic the fundamental relationship that allows us for, for instance, to be part of a scene. Animals don't do that. Aside from the famous bees who tell each other where to find a flower, but I mean, that's on a very different level. But animals don't do that. They don't have someone in the center who's talking to the group. They have a serial notion of leadership where the biggest one takes the thing and then he gives it to the second one and they can fight over that. But human beings have a, a live in scenes and the scene is based on a central sacred figure and the sacred figure is defined by the sign that designates it as opposed to appropriation but Rene is the one who first thought of the human and scenic terms Freud had a notion of a kind of a scene but everything was all set up in advance the guy was already the father and so you weren't really uh, designating him as the father he was the father to start with and then you wanted to kill him and replace him by somebody else. Whereas Rene realized that this father figure is something that only exists because the group has designated him as the father, if you like, or the scapegoat or the central figure who uh, first is the victim and then becomes God. So I think that is the most fundamental idea in uh, the history of what you might call anthropology. It allows us to replace philosophy, which is based on the notion of a kind of metaphysical existence of language. If you notice, philosophers never really understand the origin of language. I wrote a book about that, by the way, that, uh, you know, called The Scenic Imagination. But the philosophers think everything can be explained in words because the words are just uh, secondary to the reality. But no, words are the whole point of the human. So although Rene never thought of it that way, it's this basic intuition that, that I think people will remember as the, the founder of a, an, an anthropology that allows us to understand what the human is in a whole new, on a whole new level. I don't want to say it's a final anthropology, but it, it puts the notion of understanding the human at a whole new level. And I think that's why I tend to not like the word mimetic theory. It makes Rene sound too much like a social scientist. I think that Rene's notion of anthropology allows us to transcend the notion of social science, of empirical science. It's that intuition of the scene, which we all share and which we're now engaging in, by the way. That's really what he theorized for the first time. So I will stop there and say that he founded a whole new world of anthropology. Thank you, Eric. So Andrew, can you tell us about Girard's legacy when it comes to the biblical text? Yes, um, he has made it clear that the biblical text is foundational for all his thinking. Now, and it's a very interesting trajectory because his first book is about the novel. Uh, and his argument is that among other things, these novelists are not all believers. They're not Christian. Stendhal is not, Camus is not, uh, Proust is not. Uh, but that there's a narrative arc uh, that also you find in Cervantes uh, and Dostoevsky, a narrative arc of uh, fall and redemption. And I'm not going to review all, all that content, but the, you, it, this first book, Deceit, Desire, and the Novel is, 
seen as, as a Christian book. Indeed, Eric has, has said so, and he's quite right about that. And then Rene goes on to write Violence in the Sacred, which is about myth and Greek tragedy and anthropological fieldwork and the reporting of it uh, with virtually no mention uh, of scripture to a point where I was very upset when I read it because I thought all this makes sense, but where is you know your religion, my religion? And he said, don't worry, I have an article coming out, you know, which will sort of, uh, it's a coming out article as a Christian, really. And the thing is, in fact, it was reviewed, one reviewer in an important uh, newspaper in France said, well, this is the most atheist reading of religion that you'll find anywhere. Now, that's very interesting because it, it dovetails with James Allison's idea of the God of Israel you know, and the God of Jesus is so unlike all the other gods. It's really like, it's more like there being no God at all. No, unnameable, not having a host site, not having a territory, not having a face, etc. Gerard later uh, revealed that he had planned to move on to Christianity. And he realized that if I bring the Bible into it, uh, nobody will read me in Paris or the United States because in the 80s, you know, if you believe in something, uh, the deconstructionists uh, automatically took you apart. They deconstructed you. If you believed in anything, you were stupid. You know, so, so the smartest guy in the room didn't believe in anything. And, he, and some of these guys were Christians, you know. Uh, and I, I mean, I would attend these meetings, you know, and, and they'd be reading Derrida, Macron, Foucault. And, and it occurred to me that, well, all this is all very nice. I mean, these people are so, let's say, open minded. They don't believe in anything. Uh, anyway, the Bible is central. And that becomes very clear as of the next book, which is uh, Things Hidden from the Foundation of the World. And there, there are three parts. And one, the first part is the... Uh, the the well, it's it's the evolutionary part, biological evolution. It's about humanization and uh, the uh, the emergence of the human. The central part is about biblical revelation, and the third part is what he calls individual uh, psychology. That is to say, this fact that we are not individuals, skin-bound organisms, autonomous unto ourselves. By the way, the social scientists have always known that. Uh, but that doesn't reach a level of political practice. In any case, the Bible is central uh, for all his thinking, and he ascribes his original in insights to, to the great novelists, Cervantes, Dostoevsky, Proust, Madame Lafayette. Uh, he doesn't uh, make a choice about their beliefs because it's a question of what are their, their insights into human behavior. As of Violence in the Sacred, he is fully on board with an anthropology. And as of uh, things hidden in, since the foundation of the world, he has what he calls his fundamental anthropology. Uh, and that's a word I've, uh, that has not become a label for his thinking. The label we now have is called mimetic theory, which is fine. You know, it's shorthand. It all shorthand it is inadequate to the, to the task we assign it. Uh, he never used that expression. It is used as shorthand in the various uh, references. For instance, on Google, if you Google uh, mimetic theory, you'll get two things. You'll get René Girard, who's a football player in France, uh, and then you'll get uh, the site for Raven Foundation, the site for Imitatio, the site for uh, Association Recherche Mimétique in France. And the uh, expression that I think has to be brought on board once uh, we decide to say, well, what is mimetic theory, is that if it's a fundamental anthropology, it's idea of being fundamental, foundational. Its foundation is biblical revelation. And Rene does talk about biblical anthropology. And that's where you go from, let's say, the human sciences uh, to theology or to religion. Because his argument is that the really quintessential and really essential and necessary insights into human behavior and into survival of human communities, including the global community today, are, are, are to be found in biblical revelation. And there are Girardians uh, who agree with that, who are not at all Christian or Jewish or, or believers of any kind, but they don't fail to uh, recognize that uh, originality of uh, uh, of the victimary mechanism of violent reciprocity, 
of mimetic desire that you find in so many stories in the Hebrew Bible and that you find running throughout the Gospels. So the, the expression I am very fond of using when I uh, write about literature and Bible, which recently I seem to be asked to be doing, even though I'm not a Bible, Bible scholar of any kind, I don't need to be in a sense because Renee's ideas, with a lot of help from James Allison, opens up the Bible. It opens up uh, the, the clarity of the Bible. And obviously, you, you don't assume that you always know one. You, you, the scholarship is good. The, the spade work is good. That's all very important. But uh, Renee's ideas really make the Bible very, very readable um, and very approachable. There's a saying by Reinhold Niebuhr that I learned uh, in uh, the works of uh, Gil Bailey, uh, who said, read the Bible until it takes hold of you, you know? And the more time I spend with uh, Renee's ideas and with James Allison's explanations, it, it gets more of a hold on me. I mean, it's, it's talking to me. It's making more and more and more, more sense. And so the, a key expression for me is biblical anthropology because that is where uh, science and faith meet. And of course, there's a lot of energy being expended to keep them separate, uh, both on the part of the scientists uh, and on the part of, let's say, the believers. But the fact is, we live in a world which was uh, created by the Judeo-Christian revelation, whether we believe in it or not, we're, we are the beneficiaries of it. Uh, that is to say, we have certain ideas about dignity, about uh, rights, uh, and about flourishing. Uh, and about it is a good thing to be human and let's try to stay on the planet and live one, with one another. That's not obvious to a lot of people. Not, I mean, the vast majority would agree. But Renee's ideas give that a, a real uh, coherent and clear uh, explanation and one that is you can trace to uh, the origins of culture and also, especially, whether you want to do that, let's say, anthropological or, or paleoanthropological work, you can find its mechanisms in all our, our dilemmas, our, our real uh, aporias, uh, with violence today, with, with terrorism today. Uh, Rene is fond of quoting a word from Chesterton that he, who said that, you know, the 20th century, he said, actually, there are two of them. Uh, my favorite is Chesterton says, when people stop believing in God, they'll believe in anything. And we've seen how that has cashed out in the first half of the uh, previous century. But the other one is uh, the 20th century is, is, is Christian ideas gone mad, you know? So we have a sense of uh, victimage and we have violence over who's the victim and we have a competition between victims, uh, which is running amok uh, and all our problems it's an understatement. With terrorism is about that, that we, we are the victims of their terrorism and they are reprising because they are they themselves uh, the victims of post-colonial uh, oppression, which is a real fact, etc. Uh, and we can't do much to make sense out of that because we always have the initial uh, reaction, which is one of fear and then overreaction, aggression. And if you watch American politics today, you can see it, a climate of fear, which is very marketable. Uh, and it's not the first time it, it, it's happened in this country. But the fact is that the, it uh, is all part of a, a violent nexus, you know, uh, that we have to talk ourselves out of. And there are just nice things around this time of year that you, that you learn from the Bible when uh, uh, at the Annunciation, um, the angel says to Mary, do not be afraid. He goes, well, we, we tell people, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. But, but this really means don't be afraid. Don't live your life out of fear. And I fear for my country. Well, I'm part of the problem, I suppose. I fear for my country when I realize how much fear is generating political conversation. So the beauty of it is you go from biblical revelation uh, to uh, literature, you can go from biblical literary, uh, excuse me, a biblical revelation to history and to politics. Its explanatory power is enormous. Eric mentioned when he was talking about uh, Rene's first book, The Seat Desire in the Novel, mm. was it's about conversion. Yes. And that's the theme that I think that I see running throughout 
his his work and what you're getting at in the biblical text uh do not be afraid this is about conversion what do you convert from when you're no longer afraid what do you replace that fear with well um uh, that probably is a question that uh well certainly is a question that james allison can answer better than i can but of course the the genius of renee's ideas is that we have this political wing with uh, paul Bumochel, and we have a theological wing with james etc and um we all know these people what the the point is that if you do uh if you do have a relation uh of uh faith uh in your creator in uh in creation and that creation is good it is a good thing to be here and let's try to make it better and not make it worse i'm not trying to preach here i'm just trying to be as minimal as possible in, in these expressions uh james gave a talk in st louis he said well the the emotional uh equivalent of, of faith um, is uh, precisely uh, a confidence, a relaxation, and not an apprehension, not ready to fight back and things like that. And lots of people have it without religious faith. I mean, there's a strain of religious tradition, spirituality, Buddhism, etc. Uh, it's very important to not be a prisoner of that fear because that makes you a prisoner of the other's violence, the other's desire, the other's enmity, etc. Uh, and it's uh, that's what needs to be worked on. The, it really is fear or confidence, but the fear is part of a whole mimetic pathology. It's not coming out of the blue. It's not coming from the gods or Jupiter or Mars or anybody. It's coming from one another. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I think that sooner or later you have to go to a, a good psychotherapist and or uh, a, a good theologian or a good a good biblical scholar. So we're at, we're at the end of our time, and um, Sandy and Eric and Andrew, thank you so much for uh, being here today with us and for sharing uh, your relationship with Rene Girard with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Until next time, peace be with you.